Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Planning for Holiday Stress, Creating Healthy Holidays. As I said, my name is Zach Stewart, and I will be running the technical side of today's event. Yeah, it is now 2 past 1, so I am going to begin. This is just a brief reminder that this training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or HHS. The training should not be considered a substitute for individualized client care and treatment decisions. The event is being recorded. We are providing audio via computer speakers and by phone today. We strongly encourage you to use your computer audio if possible. Please choose only one audio source. If you're hearing my voice through both the phone and your computer, please hang up the phone. Your mic will be on mute for the duration of today's event. We are providing captioning for this webinar. Click the link on your screen to access the captions. We also have provided this link in the All Questions box throughout the event for the benefit of individuals arriving later. Captions will open in a window or tab that you can position anywhere you like on your screen. You can adjust the size, color, and speed of the caption. A transcript will be available for download after the event. Use the All Questions box located beneath the slides. It is clearly labeled All Questions, Tech and Content. Simply type your question in the space at the bottom of that box and press the Enter key on your keyboard or click the Send Question button. Participant comments in the chat box do not reflect the views or policies of the presenters, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the Department of Health and Human Services. And with that, uh, I've finished the housekeeping, and I will pass things over to today's moderator, Tanisha Burley. Tanisha, the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much, Zach. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us on Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day. Um, we're looking forward to this webinar because as the holidays approach, we could all use a little bit more support. Fortunately, we have the amazing Jim Sacco to help us along with this. He's worked with us on several different projects, and it's always um, we always get such great information. So let me just introduce him quickly. Um, Jim is a trainer and consultant based in Atlanta, Georgia, with more than 30 years' experience in substance abuse treatment and group facilitation. Jim has provided direct services in outpatient, residential, and community-based settings. In addition, Jim has been a trainer of other health professionals in state and local health departments, CBOs, hospitals, and substance abuse treatment settings. His ongoing clients have included, have included the World Health Organization, CDC, SAMHSA, HRSA, OPA, and OAH-funded training centers and health departments across the country. He has trained more than 50,000 healthcare workers in his career, and we're so pleased to have him today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tanisha. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Let's see. There's my webcam. Uh, so hello, everybody. Hi in far Texas, New York City. Somewhere down in Florida, Lucky Julia is uh, warm today. Fran's in Boston. Anyway, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm uh, delighted you took time. Uh, I think this is a really uh, important time for all of us who care about our, our clients to think about the unique stressors that come up associated with the holidays. That's really what this is about. We, we are, are not here just to talk about how to not eat too much pumpkin pie or uh, whatever else, but uh, uh, really it's a chance for all of us to think about how to provide additional support for people that are going to need it. I guess. I just, as I was preparing the webinar, the, the folks at SAMHSA said, hey, we, we think there's a need. And it, it caused me to reflect on how often in my clinical practice uh, 
people around the holidays, starting in November, really through uh, through January, November, December. My experience is people uh, act out in ways that aren't healthy, disappear, relapse, uh, make bad make bad unconscious choices, um, have emotional stuff maybe that they're not even tying to their uh, background, whatever else, and so. As I thought about this, I thought what I wanted to share is just some some ideas from my own clinical practice. After again many years of just seeing people fall apart and get flaky, and, and the stress that creates for me, uh, obviously part of this is about how to help you uh, manage the difficult times. What what I have taken to, and what I what I'm suggesting is that we all look at proactively naming. Uh, what's going on, you know, sort of saying in advance, hey, the holidays are coming up, finding out about people's plans, uh, finding out about uh, what stressors they anticipate, offering some coaching and working with them on a plan. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think probably everybody could use that. I know very few people for whom stress isn't part of the holidays, but certainly as I think about the needs of people with serious behavioral health, substance use disorder problems, it seems like the possibility of difficulty through the holidays uh, is is fairly substantial. So uh, that's what we've come here to do. Those are the uh, the objectives. There uh, want to think about how we assess who is vulnerable, particularly to stress around this time. Uh, think about resiliency. You know, I I, uh, I should say I've, I've recently participated in a ACEs Adverse Childhood Experience meeting, and so I'm all hopped up on. Uh, vulnerability and resiliency it is a great meeting that I attended in North Carolina on adverse child experiences. Um, strategies for conscious planning, that really is at the heart of this this uh, model, the idea here that we consciously think about, okay, it's Halloween, we've got some hard times coming up, what are you going to do to support yourself, to, particularly if you're new to recovery, if you're interacting with people with whom you've had a difficult history, how are you going to take care of yourself? What support from from us? What support from your recovery community? Um, and then uh, some ideas about how to mitigate uh, holiday stress. So we're going to we're going to do some brainstorming. I appreciate everybody getting in the in the, in the chat box now. If you've if you've never been on a webinar with me, I I, I would say at my core, I'm really uh, an interactive trainer. I really prefer to be in the basement of a health department, the basement of a CBO. And so the fact that we're uh, here virtually, I try to encourage chat. We've got several polls. I'm going to ask you your opinion. So if you have, didn't hear Zach talk about the public chat function, that box is there. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I don't have uh, a full hour and a half of content, so there's time for your questions. We, we've got a small-ish group, so there'll be time for you to get your questions answered. And most importantly, what I think is I have some answers, but what I also think is those of you on this webinar have some answers as well. And so if you don't type in the chat, if you don't offer your suggestions, um, you lose an opportunity to offer your gifts to other people. So, so again, if you're willing, uh, uh, I would love to hear from you. Again, there'll be several structured conversations through today, and, and I really hope you'll take advantage of that. So uh, I, I, uh, you tell me. I'm going to start with our, our first question here, get you, get you typing, get you thinking. Um, what happens uh, is the question if we don't do this work. So in other words, if we just sort of blindly go into the holidays, don't bring up planning, don't think about uh, needs for specialized planning. If you'll go ahead, Zach's put the question box down there. He's got a place to type your answer. If we miss this opportunity, Based on your clinical experience, I know several of you have been around. Uh, what happens if we don't step up and say, I'm going to actively assess and help you with holiday planning? Again, if you'll go either in the chat box or, like I said, it's question one. Uh, I'm listening for Catherine Montefiore, good Italian kid, or she married well. Christopher, Denise, Eugenia, any thoughts? Who have I got? Joe, Julia, Christina spelled the correct way with a K. Laurent, Lynette, Monica, Buenos Aires, Monica, Samantha. Any ideas what happens if we don't uh, actively collaborate? I see some people typing. So wait a minute, but I think uh, I just wanted to hear from you. 
what happens if we don't help by planning ahead. Anybody, any thoughts about what you've seen happen if we don't actively get engaged with people on the front end of their holidays? Loose clients, thank you. Clients relapse, clients feel alone, increased depression, great, absolutely. Feeling alone, clients relapsing, disappearing, absolutely. Relapse, relapse, uh, pay, yeah, yeah. Again, that's my belief, that patients, danger, return to active use, relapse. Increased psychiatric, absolutely go off your medication. The stress causes a spike in substance use. Uh, Self-harm, I, I, I'm not prepared to talk a lot about that. Uh, client circumstances worsen. I, I love somebody said client and clinicians hit with stressors that can help them feel isolated. Again, part of what I'm sharing is based on the fact that year after year, I kind of dread the holidays. I kind of just feel so worn out uh, being with people in pain uh, and thought, there must be a way to not be surprised by the stress that comes up clients and clinicians. Beautiful. Yep. Relapse, clients alone, feeling depressed. Yeah, that's why I'm here. Exactly. Those are, those are exactly the kind of things why I, I wanted to say uh, I think it's valuable for us to introduce the topic. Um, so I'm moving on. Uh, the slide here tells you my bias. And, and uh, I, I'm that guy who... When I'm sitting there in the audience, I'm always trying to figure out, well, what's this guy's story? What's he selling? You know, and so a lot of times I'll just kind of put it out there. That way, if, if you disagree with me, you can say, hey, I disagree. You can minimize the webinar and fire up your Facebook. Oh, no, don't do that. That would be bad. Um, uh, but you, you, so, so here's what I think. I, I think a majority of people we, we work with have a history of trauma or experience of adverse child experience. Uh, as uh, Tanisha said, when we started, I've worked with lots and lots of uh, people doing work for SAMHSA, working with people with uh, co-occurring disorder or triple disorder where HIV is part of the mix. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of research that says people with HIV have higher incidence than general public of the trauma history. I certainly know from my own experience that, that mental health and substance use problems can relate to what happened in childhood. Most codepend uh, most consumers, rather, uh, with substance use also have some codependence or untreated codependence in their life. Oh, yes, I did. Uh, I'm, I'm going to name it. I just think that uh, uh, traits like unhealthy helping, caretaking of other people, not paying attention to ourselves uh, is uh, uh, something that we fall into. And my experience at this time of year is interacting with family, interacting with, with some people who haven't been working on their own issues uh, can lead to uh, further challenges. Stigma of HIV is not anything we're done with. I just want to put that out there, that as we think about stressors associated with going home, seeing family, going back to the town that we were raised in, whether you call that home or not, um, what strikes me is that going with HIV is different than going with a high blood pressure or sickle cell. And, and so the, the bottom line is these questions of does family know, do I disclose, do I not disclose, is a chronic stressor for many people living with HIV. And so as we prepare to think about the needs, I just think that that issue of, you know, I wish I could say in, in what are we, 2017, in 2017, every family was going to, uh, uh, you know, knit an Afghan, a bake a banana bread and say, oh, we think it's great that our loved one with HIV is, is coming to the family reunion, to the Christmas party, and for a lot of families, it's a, they're, they're not there. For a lot of our most vulnerable consumers, they are still going to face the possibility of stigma. Uh, for individuals from unhealthy families, there's a broad umbrella term, uh, messed up families, uh, the emotional reaction to the holidays can be painful, and this can increase the possibility of relapse or re-injury. I think that's what we talked about earlier. My experience is at some level, for a lot of my folks, they never give up wishing they had the family they saw on the Hallmark Movie Channel. Does that make sense? Uh, I think that, that whatever work you've done, recovery work, whatever else, at some level, I think maybe even especially this time of year, recognizing what your family can't do, uh, recognizing the, the deficits, uh, people sort of fall into uh, a kind of pain around that that I think we need to acknowledge, plan for in advance. And this last reminder is why we're here, conscious planning. A model that we're going to use just says, uh, can we 
uh, by introducing the topic early, help people with a plan to, to create additional stress, help people to uh, uh, avoid unnecessary stress. Uh, Fran says, uh, one of her friends talks about wanting to be the Norman Rockwell family. Don't we all want to be the, the Norman Rockwell family? And many of our most vulnerable consumers, the family doesn't look anything like the, the pretty pictures uh, the, uh, that they see. So uh, this is the model that, that we're uh, putting forward for clinicians. And again, what I'm aware of is some of you probably are doing some of this work, maybe have some of this already done. Uh, people work in all kinds of uh, different um, uh, care settings. Ooh, Denise hit on something important, uh, seasonal affective disorder. I hadn't even included that, but, but doesn't the fact that we've got the shortest day of the year, three days before Christmas, uh, impact the potential vulnerability as someone who uh, loves the sunshine and, and misses it when it's not here? Yeah, how does even the time of year? That's great, Denise. Thank you. Um, so uh, the model here, like I said, we, we don't want it to be a cookbook. Uh, rather, it's something for you to think about based on your practice setting, based on who you are, based on what you already know. But, but we just thought about how uh, in, in good, good practice, people know what the consumer's history is. If you don't know it, you conduct active assessment around their history. Um, this third bullet just says sometimes it falls to us to share concerns. I think that um, one of the concerns I have about consumers this time of year, maybe us, is it's easy to kind of fall into automatic. Well, why are you going back to Ohio to the family that abused you? Well, that's what people do. That's what I'm supposed to do. And, and so there's a way in which we kind of fall into automatic. You know, why do you celebrate with those foods or those places or those people? Because, well, that's what we always do. And so sometimes as clinicians, what I'm saying is it's good practice for us to say, you know, I have a concern. Because, again, I think our most vulnerable consumers have been living in automatic ways. Maybe nobody's ever said uh, uh, the family's dysfunctional. Maybe nobody's ever made the connection for them of that stress leading to challenges with your mental health or substance use disorder. Uh, so sometimes it's up to us to share a concern. Uh, certainly it's good practice for us to collaborate on a plan for coping, uh, figure out what challenges they anticipate, and build around those. And finally, for us to, to link people to some additional support. So that's our model. I've done that quickly because it's the structure for the rest of the, web, rest of the webinar. So tough to say, rest of the webinar. Sounds a little like Donald Duck doing that. Anyway, uh, so that's what we're going to do. So uh, let's start with uh, understanding a consumer's history. And uh, thanks to Myra Bennett for uh, adding uh, some art to this. I, I think that face uh, says it all in, in terms of, of who I'm concerned about. There's a, a longing there. There's a, a sadness there. I, I think that, uh, uh, that that picture talks about why understanding someone's history is important. So as we're thinking about history, and again, maybe you're in a clinical setting where you've already captured this. If you haven't, I just think it's good practice for us to, to understand the, the family of origin dynamics if someone's going to interact with their family over the holidays. I like to say really clearly, especially if it's a new client or someone whose history I don't know well, tell me about your family's history. Tell me about the, the family function. The bottom line is they're walking back into the middle of the movie. The family my experience, usually the family's not in treatment, not invested in changing, not invested in getting any better. And so they're walking into whatever used to be there. And so figuring out what the family history is like, uh, what the family uh, reaction to stress is, because again, I'd argue that for everybody in the system, there's going to be some stress associated with the holidays. And so kind of talking a bit about that. Um, in, in terms of friend network and whatever else, I'm, I'm sort of an old school drug and alcohol, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of the closet and say um, in, in many ways I've, I've been brought along to a kind of harm reduction view of the world and whatever else, but, but one of the ways I remain old school, kind of 12-step, is I just think if you are going back to those places where you first started shooting dope and to those people who uh, you used to do meth with or hanging out in the clubs where you used to do meth, I just think uh, you are very likely uh, to resume problematic use. And, and so being mindful, talking to people about playgrounds and playmates is something. Understanding people's current social support, I think, is something else for us to know. If someone is connected to a recovery network, 
has adaptive people in their life, has a functional support group going on, whatever, uh, that's important information. Uh, the opposite of that is someone who's lacking current social support. Uh, I think that's a flag to us because my argument here is the person with better social support uh, can build on that, needs to be encouraged to build on that. The person without current uh, uh, social support is going to need for us. To, there's a whole lot more work on us from my perspective proactively to kind of say we're going to shore up, again, 12-step support group, whatever else. Denise says also old school. That's what I'm talking about. It's a bit of playground and playmate there. Um, historical precedent, what's it been like when you go back there before? I mean, I think part of part of the dysfunction here, you know, the, the, old, the old phrase, um, the old AA phrase, going, doing the same thing, expecting a different result, the definition of insanity. I think what we've got here sometimes is people say, well, yeah, I'm going back to, uh, uh, you know, Ohio, uh, and it's going to be great. And I say, oh, okay, well, tell me about last Christmas. Well, Daddy beat up Mama, and my brother relapsed and broke a beer bottle over my head and blah, blah, blah. And you just go, well, what's different? You know, why would today be different? So understanding what sort of typical uh, holidays are like, what, and, and then if there have been some that have been not successful, that has led to relapse, created stress, again, it falls to us, I think, to proactively shine a light on the thing because I think, as I said, some of our most vulnerable folks fall into doing things automatically, uh, not, not, not consciously thinking through do I or don't I want to do that, and may not connect the dots between what happened last Thanksgiving and the likelihood of the same thing happening this year. I think what's important as we're framing this is trying to understand how these uh, potential problems in, uh, conflict with our client's current goals. Um, uh, for those of you who've, who've been with me before, I'm a motivational interviewing trainer, and so I'm always thinking through the lens of how is the current uh, uh, choice dis discordant with something they've told me they want. So someone has said, I, I want to get off probation, or I want to be sober, or I want to get my kids back, or whatever, whatever their goal has been, I think it's really important as we're understanding the history and the risk they're taking that we link that back to uh, you have said you want to get your kids back, going back to where you're from and the prescription opiates that you know will be there, whatever the issue is, um, but making sure we tie it back. Um, so I've got a poll for you here. We're going to do several polls, as I said. This is unusual in some ways in the sense that I don't want to just hear myself. Um, so I want you to think about, you gave me some good input on why people don't succeed. Zach's pulled up a poll there uh, down below the slides on the left side. Uh, and I'd like you to, as forced choice, you can only do one of these. So if you would, bring your cursor down to the bottom left. Uh, what are the reasons, the most common reason, that's the key phrase, most common, is it that people return to unhealthy settings? Uh, is it re-injury based on how they were parented? Is it the stress without coping skills? Is it unhealthy peers? I've got nine of you voting. I'm going to wait. We usually do 60 seconds. So if you're not in there yet, I'd love to see everybody who's on the webinar. Gosh, you guys are doing great. One more minute. And we'll close it. Excellent. There we are. Looks like the winner or the loser, depending, is increased stress without adequate coping skills. So I guess uh, you guys are on the right webinar. I, I came up with the right topic. Again, the idea here is the stress of the holidays is a real thing. And unless we create new coping skills, facilitate people developing new coping skills, it's unlikely or, or they're at risk uh, to not succeed on their treatment goals. Thank you, guys. Gosh, that was a great turnout for that poll. I've got several more coming, a couple more chats, so stay tuned. I appreciate hearing from you. So uh, next bullet in our model, like I said, I, 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 as I thought through what the steps would, would involve, the next step is uh, doing assessment. If you, if you don't have the relevant history to roll up your sleeves, then we'll figure out what did happen and what I need to know. So before we do that, let's uh, jump in another chat box and think about do's and don'ts. I'd like you to think about your clinical experience. We're about to ask people some really personal questions as we think about ways to uh, invite 
uh, conversation about people's past, uh, family substance use, family history, people's emotional reaction. If you would, there in the two chats that uh, Zach's put up for us, I've got what we're called the do's and don'ts. I'd like us collectively to do the do's and don'ts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with a do, uh, give people permission, give people permission to disclose at whatever level they want. I really think that acknowledging we're asking some in intrusive questions and saying, hey, you tell me what you want. There's something about giving people control over self-disclosure as we're doing assessment. Anybody else, either on the do side or don't side, as we prepare to talk about family history, previous uh, holiday experiences, and really to, to nose around about family dysfunction and people's history. I see several of you getting in. I'll wait a minute. Judgment-free, thank you. Denise says a judgment-free attitude. Fran, beautiful, says ask direct questions about trauma, asking people to give the details. So people jump around and say, well, gosh, should I or shouldn't I name the trauma? The, the idea here is it's already, I've heard it's already the elephant, the phrase, it's already the elephant in the room. Either you acknowledge it or you don't. And I think to proactively talk about the things that we call trauma, your definition. Uh, Christina talks about provide additional support. Absolutely. I think wherever we are, you guys, 80% of you said the, the reason people have trouble is they have stress without coping to proactively say, here's where meetings are available, here's where groups are available. The great thing here in Atlanta, and I think probably a lot of places, 12-step meeting sites host marathon meetings and food meetings and blah, blah, blah. And so uh, I know a number of people for whom the holidays are centered around what's going on in their recovery community instead of going back to the craziness in Pennsylvania or wherever. Um, uh, Laron says, assess for trauma and provide support. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, ask clients permission. That's beautiful, Catherine. There's something about saying, would it be okay if we talk about? And again, uh, I like to say, I'm going to ask some personal questions. If it's okay with you, would that be okay? And then my, my statement earlier, you tell me what you want to tell me uh, as a way to do that. Um, Samantha absolutely says, being open-minded, people don't always believe. This is a rough road for people that need to be the expert. Um, I, I, I am routinely humbled as a clinician that, uh, you know, I have this desire to be the smartest person in the room. Maybe I'm the only one on the webinar who wants to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, but, yeah, you can say this terrible thing's going to happen, your family sounds crazy, your abusive uncle is still going to be there, whatever. And, you know, some people are going to look you dead in the eye and say, this Christmas is going to be great. This is going to be the best Christmas ever. You know, what are you going to do about it? You can, you can get in a wrestling match with people, or you can say, I'm going to honor your perception. I mean, there's something respectful about what Sam's telling us, with, which is, I'm going to honor your perception of your life. You know, that uh, one of the MI phrases I like a lot, people are the experts in their own life. People are the experts. Oh, Samantha says, Let, let's avoid I told you so. Absolutely. Again, back to proving we're the, the smartest person. Let me do one more minute. I saw a couple people type, and then I'm going to anything else in your do's and don'ts. Those are great suggestions, everybody. Like I said, I'm just mindful that um, we're asking some really tough stuff here. We're talking about trauma, family addiction, family dysfunction, feelings of not having safe attachment. You know, when I think about the biggest injury, um, Got it. Thank you. When I think about the biggest injury, it's where people haven't had a safe, nurturing relationship. And, and, and so as I'm thinking about inviting people to go back and tell us about what happened, uh, those people that didn't have, don't have uh, any sort of safe connection to somebody, didn't have, whether that was grandma or auntie or mom or something, but, but those people especially are ones that I think we need to be really mindful that we're going into some heavy stuff using these tips below that you're providing is an excellent idea. Thank you all for that. Beautiful suggestions. Um, so what I, listen with feedback at times. Thank you, Sam. Uh, add fuel to fire. Oh, Chris, Christina says, add fuel to fire. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Your family is horrible. Uh, I, I think for us to stay neutral. Thank you, Christina. That, that we, if we take sides, uh, uh, we, we have the potential to be seen as coercive. And I think you know, trying to find this balance between sharing a concern, validating their concern, 
and not jumping on the bandwagon. What I worry about is people are wired to defend their family. You ever had that? I wish I had the hand-raising function. Thing. You say your family's crazy, 99% of people are going to say, my family ain't crazy, you know, whatever. Even they've just told you that. There's a kind of knee-jerk reaction. So uh, in, in terms of conducting assessment, we've got great validated tools. The SAMHSA website uh, down there, uh, excellent, excellent tools, all the, all the good stuff. Uh, I, I, as I said, I, I was impacted by this ACEs meeting I went to, so the adverse childhood experiences there, physical abuse. The reason I like the ACEs is it talks about abuse, but it's much broader, mental illness, uh, being around addiction, uh, being uh, d divorce or separation, incarceration of a household member. How many of our consumers can tell us what happened when daddy went to jail and what it was like when daddy went to jail of a close friend whose dad died when he was 11. And that is still the seminal event of his life, like his dad's death, the family's inability to cope in a functional way with the dad's death. And, and, and so, uh, again, if you're not familiar with the ACEs, it's a CC study that started, gosh, I think mid-80s, tracking how a cluster of these, the more ACEs, the higher impact. We'll talk about impact of ACEs later on in the webinar. So uh, other screening tools, here's some trauma screening tools. Fran said, ask directly about trauma. I certainly agree. Best, uh, best practice is to use tools that have been validated. Um, these are all available at the uh, VA website. I think we could, we could all debate if the VA is doing enough or, or whatever else. The VA trauma material is outstanding. So if you are someone that, that needs some tools, about trauma is curious about uh, ptsd.va.gov, just uh, excellent, excellent. I mean, I think, you know, of necessity because of the prevalence of trauma, particularly among returning vets, uh, they are, I think, a national leader in terms of giving us tools. So uh, assessing resiliency, I talked about that earlier, and, and as I was preparing to do this, I thought, what do we know about resiliency? You know, these bad things can happen. These bad things can happen, but it doesn't affect some people. Some people do whatever. Where there's been a supportive adult relationship, the most important protective factor. We all know people who should have, who should have been crazy with a mentally ill mom or whatever, you know, uh, uh, incarcerated dad or, you know, violence or abuse in their family or their neighborhood, but who seem to have coped. And again, this idea that there was a grandmother or an adult caregiver or somebody in my life. Sense of self-efficacy, uh, uh, again, when people believe that their life is in their control, when their inner voice, when I define self-efficacy, people with high level of self-efficacy say, I can do that. I can make my mind up and have things happen. So uh, another factor that's going to mean regardless of what they experience, these people are more likely to um, have weathered the storm. O opportunities to build adaptive skill. That is, maybe it was at school. We all, many of us can think about people for whom school or sports or other achievement, musical achievement, was an adaptive skill that helped them. And then self-regulatory capacity, I think, it starts with insight. Um, uh, I think of a, a friend's kid who, uh, he was just a difficult kid. There's no way around it. He was a difficult kid. And at some point, this little guy 13 or 14 uh, started to act a lot better with this family, with everybody. And at some point, his mama said, well, I, I, don't know, I can't say his name, uh, Mr. X, uh, you're uh, acting a lot better than you used to. And he kind of said, yeah, I realized that if I kept acting that way, people weren't going to like me, and I want people to like me or something. So, so again, the self-regulatory, this could recognize, again, as I said, starts with insight, me, he was just a mopey, too emotional kid and too volatile. Saw that insight, said, I'm going to go about changing the way I act on my emotion and, and uh, turn things around. So this is a kid with high level of self-regulation. So, and then the last reminder here is, is those who've done well uh, have faith, uh, faith community, whatever that means to them. Some people, uh, wherever that comes from, a sense of optimism, and again, sometimes that's that's a spiritual place. Sometimes that's uh, you know I, I have another client I'm thinking of who just said I, they knew their life was going to be better than the than the deck they were dealt. You know, you, we, we've all 
seen people who, in spite of the circumstances, said, I have an optimism, said early on of an optimism about my life. And then how cultural strength, uh, you know, his wonderful work on cultural competence and how cultural strengths are going to provide resiliency from difficulty. And, and, uh, and again, some of those uh, lead to, this is a Harvard website I stumbled on as part of this webinar, developingchild.harvard, but, but there's a whole body of study about what builds resiliency uh, in this institute at Harvard. Very interesting stuff. If you want to know more about that, uh, I'd uh, have you think about that. So sometimes it's up to us to uh, share a concern. As I said earlier, sometimes we have to um, shine a light on the thing. I, I, I'm back to your suggestions earlier, finding that balance between sharing a concern and not being the expert, not being critical, not uh, arguing with someone's own perception of their family or their situation, I think is the challenge here. But there are times when I've felt, if I don't name this, I'm not doing the right thing clinically. Clinically, I have to say, I'm concerned about you going back without more thought given to what you're uh, doing. So um, let's uh, fire up another poll. I'm going to ask you to check back in. Uh, we've all been there where we're getting, the, to me, it's always in my stomach. I this gurgling in my stomach like, wow, this is a really fa crazy family. You ever had that? I'm, I'm sure most of us have been gathering history or gotten a whiff of things. That, oh, my goodness, this is a really crazy family. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to say it. And I guess I'm asking you, uh, to think about your own discomfort. So if you're willing, again, take your cursor down to the bottom left. The reason I am reluctant, your own reluctance, to address dysfunction in your consumer's family of origin, what makes it difficult to step up and say, you know, I'm thinking there's something about your family. What is it, again, is it that you're uncomfortable coming off as an expert? Do you have difficulty articulating what's healthy, what's not? Do you fear reinforcing pessimism about their life that somehow I think are saying it's sort of, yeah, you a mess and you're never going to get any better? Uh, or is it uh, concerns about people's defensiveness? Just another 15 seconds. Thank you all jumping in. I love you guys playing along. Thank you for that. And just two more votes. All right. Well, there it is. Uh, the poll results are in. Uh, looks like some of you are saying, I don't want to reinforce a negative view, but most of you, most of us, are saying, I worry about client defensiveness. And again, that's the dance. If, if, uh, if I, from my perspective, sometimes if I don't say I'm concerned about your family's functioning and I see them go off to uh, California back to a problematic situation, I worry that I'm not doing what I think is, is good care. On the other hand, people are going to get defensive. And again, even people who think family is problematic may come back and say, but wait, you don't know. He's got good qualities as well. Everybody, everybody rushes to defend the good qualities. So yeah, I think that that's the tension we're naming. Like I said, for me, the reason I'm pushing you is I think ethically sometimes we just can't put somebody on that bus back to Nevada without saying, girl, you better take care of yourself because here's what I think about the functioning of your family. So uh, here's some ideas here on the, the chart. I'm going to walk through these. To, uh, I, I'm going to give you some language. Again, I just thought uh, this is not uh, language you need, you, you need to use. I don't want to create a cookbook, uh, but I, I did as part of this webinar want to give people some tools. And so uh, what I'm suggesting is that the, there's four steps. We offer the rationale. Here's why I want to talk about this. We have to name the concerns directly, make the connection between uh, our, our concerns and, and sort of why it might affect uh, the outcome they want in their life. I think what's, what's really important, this maybe gets around, mitigates some of the concern about reaction that we talked about, which is I'm going to assess my consumer's response. I'm going to hear from them what they think about it. You know, the old MI phrase, I'm going to ask permission first, then I'm going to tell you the findings of your assessment or 
whatever, ask, tell. And in MI, there's a third ask, which is, what do you think about what I've just said? And a lot of people are going to say, well, that may be well and true, but I'm not a problem drinker, or my family's just fine, or whatever. And so making sure you take time. And then the, the gold quadrant says, is there or isn't there opening to move to planning? Again, I think part of what's good client-centered care is we raise a concern, we ask them their perception, and we feel the water out. Do you think you need additional support? Is there anything you think you need to do? So the next few slides offer some language about this. I'm not going to read to you clearly from this webinar. We've got some really smart people on the thing, but uh, offer the rationale. Uh, one of the things I add here is reinforcing autonomy. You know, I think one of the ways to not come off bossy and the experts say, but you're the expert in your own life. You're clearly able to make decisions, and you'll have to decide for yourself, finding your language to figure out how to share a concern. So uh, offering the rationale, why you talk about, name the concern directly. Uh, again, here's the idea that we say out loud, this thing that happened, this history, can lead to relapse. Oh, and and uh, uh, think about whatever harm may come. I think we can, in general terms, say, I've worked with clients through the years, and here are the things that I've seen happen to other people. And again, it may, people's defense may be, well, that's not going to happen to me. But at some point to say, when I see people new in recovery, going back to a family where everybody's drinking all day long, or your old friends are going to be uh, stealing each other's Percocet down the block, I worry about how you're going to uh, be able to cope with that. And the harm may be you uh, relapsing. Oh, teaching people about codependence. Again, not everybody, but at some point, you know, recognizing I think these conversations lead to an opportunity to say, you know, you don't, you can honor yourself and that's not being selfish. You know, those of you who are on the self-care webinar, I talked enough about our codependence that many of us I know are in that journey, but, but sort of giving people permission uh, to, to honor themselves describing boundaries, talking about not being guilted into going to families. Again, I think that we, talk, we talked a lot about danger to the active uh, substance user. Uh, I also think that uh, someone with active untreated codependence can really uh, fall into some harm over the course of holidays, unconscious holidays. Uh, stress the value of healthy coping. Again, I think we, we move to solution and say, yeah, I want you to I want to help you if you're willing. I'd like to help you prevent problems so that people can cope with difficult times if that's something you'd like to do. The other thing that gets to what Fran said in, in the public chat a minute ago was giving people permission to not go home, that, that sometimes people don't know that it's an option. And I use the term divorce their past. Um, I wouldn't say it's happened a lot, but I've known people for whom really seriously limiting, and in a couple cases, divorcing their family was the healthy choice, just sort of saying, I can't have anything to do with them. Um, and an awful, painful choice, not something anybody, I, I think, can come to easily. Uh, but in the couple instances that I'm thinking, the family was so dysfunctional, the, the pain was so real, um, and be okay, Denise, at be okay letting family members know you're allergic to alcohol. It's a great phrase. I'm allergic to alcohol because there's always somebody pushing eggnog, aren't they, the eggnog pushers? Um, so this fourth bullet was about the consumer response. What do you think about what I said? How do you feel about what I said? Uh, attend to their emotions and watch their reactions. You seem mad. This seems to make you sad. Whatever you observe um, and, and going ahead and naming uh, what you see and inviting them to talk about what their feelings are. And then uh, move to planning if that's indicated, if a client's willing to go there with you. I've got some motivational interviewing language I suspect many of you uh, have been through there. Listen for change talk and pull out your pom-poms. Somebody says, well, I know I, I ought to, I'm willing to, I'm ready to. That's the change talk. You shake your pom-pom. Woohoo! that's great. Yes, let me help you figure out. Uh, when we hear change talk, we explore it, we affirm it, we reflect it, we summarize it, the MI training. I say we're all ears is the acronym there. Basically, you pull out your pom-poms 
and say you're doing some great stuff, reinforce that. If you hear sustained talk, that is the reasons to not change. Change talk is defined as the good things about changing. Sustained, sustained talk is the argument against change. You want to just reflect that and change gears. In other words, if you're pressing on, I think your daddy's an alcoholic, and you go back there, and they start talking about daddy's no alcoholic, and that sheriff was just out to get him. That's why he got that DUI. You get into all that defensiveness stuff. You want to just say, okay, so daddy's not a drinker, doesn't have a problem drinking. And avoiding the writing reflex is where we get in that tug of war. We've all been there, that tug of war of, oh, yeah, your family is dysfunctional. And what's going to happen? Somebody's going to come back and say, no, they're not dysfunctional. You don't know what you're talking about. And we're in some kind of tug of war. That's the writing reflex. Uh, folks, we can never win a tug of war with somebody. Their perception is always right, and particularly as it relates to if somebody says, no, I'm going to be fine, there's no need to create an additional support plan. At some point, we've planted a six seed. My experience with people like that is a bunch of people might be initially defensive, going to come back a week or two later, maybe somewhere else in support group or 12-step meeting and say, you know, uh, that, that bald guy said something. Maybe it does make sense. Maybe I do need to make a plan. So sometimes we plant a seed that happens later and the planning doesn't happen. If a client's willing to go there, we develop a plan for coping. Uh, a most important thing, I think, anytime we talk about plan is to say, what have you done in the past that's helped you succeed? So in other words, I want to hear about when you've had a previous holiday that's gone well and you didn't drink and you didn't beat up your brother or you didn't relapse with your old friends. What happened? If there's any of that to build on, uh, let's go ahead and start there. Uh, you might want to... Um, share what's working for other people. Well, I've heard other people, we, we've lost a word on this slide, this missing word is manage coercion. Coercion. Uh, the idea here is sometimes when we're offering self-disclosure or doing whatever else, I have to be mindful when I'm offering options that it doesn't sound like here's the thing you're supposed to do. And so language like, well, I've had some clients try X or Y or Z. I always talk about giving multiple options instead of one, making sure a client has enough uh, self-efficacy so they can still make their own choice. And then the last reminder down here about planning is that people have to take care of their bio, psycho, social, spiritual needs. What are you going to do to tend to your physical well-being? The bio, what are you going to do to tend to your physical well-being, psychological speaks to your emotional well-being, your thoughts. Social speaks to your interpersonal well-being, and spiritual means tending to your spiritual self. And so the whole idea as we move to planning is in the same way I like to think about assessment being what's going on physically, emotionally, interpersonally, spiritually, that our plan of care follows that same frame. Um, and so I want you guys to join me thinking about potential planning options. Zach's done the magic down there again. And what I want to do is think about if someone says, client says, you're right, I better get better at taking care of my spiritual well-being, my physical well-being, my emotional, psychological well-being, my interpersonal or social well-being, what might consumers consider doing. I'd like you to go ahead and type right in their specific suggestions. The bottom line is sometimes if I knew how to care for myself, I wouldn't be in the state I'm in. So being able to offer some practical suggestions. So again, for those of you who are willing, bring your cursor down. Let's come up with as many as we can. How do we take care of our spiritual selves, our physical selves, our emotional well-being, our interpersonal? I'm going to type in here. Let's see. What do I want to add? most important to me for my holidays, I'm going to say under emotional, feel your feelings. That One of the traps I fall into is, is how do I not feel? Uh, Catherine talks about attending church or connecting with a spiritual community. Joe says step work and, and the fact that if you're doing good 12-step work, it's going to lead you to uh, spir spiritual awakening. Catherine says, exercise or take a walk, eat well. Absolutely. Again, the point today is not how to eat less pumpkin pie, but clearly if I'm uh, committed to a plan, I'm going to be healthy 
uh, wash cigarettes, cigarettes and other things. Uh, Debbie says, let's take 10 minutes. Gosh, Debbie, we should all do that, seems like. Uh, in terms of 10 minutes to our motion, Catherine, that's exactly right. Part of what I thought is coming in more regularly for care. You'll see as I talk about interventions, uh, some people are going to need more care, going to need more involvement with their recovery community, more actively involved with the sponsor. And y'all, Goodman says, treatment activities share treatment goal set. Era Call, Goodman. Era Call. Uh, Monica says, annual medical exam. Beautiful. Take care of your health. Faith-based organization. Guys, you're doing great stuff. Let's do a few more because I really need these. I need these for myself. I'm, I'm not lying. Physical care. Um, fun exercise like Zumba. I'm going to go to Zumba with Denise. I'm listening for Tanisha and Fran. What you going to do to tend to your stress now? Christina, time for, with friends. Thank you. People who support positivity. Thank you. Yeah, one of the ways to ask that, Christina, I think, is to say, who are the people that build you up? Who are the people that help you feel relaxed and loved and valuable? Whatever language we use. But yeah, Monica's got it. How to consciously think about supportive friends. Who's going to support you? through this. Talk to your support network, treatment activities. And these guys going to Zoom. As Samantha says, go to meditation. I think that doesn't have to be go somewhere. It can just be take 10 minutes of quiet, fun exercise. Thank you, Joe Davidson. Uh, thoughts and feelings. Share all your thoughts, feelings. And he says, you use an EAP if you got it. Um, yeah, guys, excellent suggestions. I just, I, I take some time to do this. Sober dances. Denise going to go to a sober dance. Samantha's going to yoga. Tanisha's saying invite good supportive family and friends like her partners at Alterum. Uh, buy a new book, says Christina. Yeah, you guys, great suggestions. Again, I take some time to do this just because I think <laughs> Fran says have a latke. And right, at, right under that she says, could it hurt? Could it hurt? I'm going to have a latke with Fran. Um, I think what's important is to get this practical with consumers, I would argue some of our most vulnerable folks don't know the steps that people take, need us to actively help them develop a plan. So this isn't just um, a road activity. I really think whether you're doing this work individually, uh, I think this would be a fun group thing. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But, but potentially, for those of you who do group, to say, hey, we got a bunch of stuff coming up here. How can we do it more healthy? Uh, and being willing to offer people uh, those uh, Choices. Zach Rowe, can we just play a social game? Quiet time. Tanisha says get some quiet time. Eugenia's got one more. Journaling. Thank you, Eugenia. Excellent. Let me see Joe got one. You guys are doing great. Social game that involves lots of laughing. Beautiful. Invite a safe friend. That's great. That, that's a great suggestion, Eugenia. Can you bring your sponsor another sober friend if you have to go? If you say, I have to go or it's the right thing to go. Joe says, funny Movies, good books, stuff that takes your mind off your troubles. Great. So I'm going to move forward. This next slide just gives you guys, again, those of you that, that do this work in, in group settings, give you some ideas about uh, how you could adapt this model, uh, ad adapt planning in a group setting. Um, one of the suggestions I have is what about with, within the group format, talking about uh, holidays as a stressful time. So in, in, in the way you would in a kind of psychoeducational group, just kind of saying, well, we either offering this as an additional group or uh, if certainly if you're doing sort of aftercare recovery support group, somehow saying, you know, we've got some tough times ahead. Let's uh, discuss those as a group. I really, I keep coming back to this, and maybe it's my own, uh, my own process uh, of, of recovery from my stuff, but I just think, it's easy to focus on what happens as someone with a mental health disorder, with substance use disorder. But I do think teaching about codependence actively is going to be really important. That has two things, to invite consumers to think about their own codependence and also to think about the family of origin that they came from. Because my sense, if you're uh, – consumers' families or anything like my consumers' families, you don't have an addict in isolation or a problem substance user 
in isolation. Most often, there's a cluster of users and codependents who are all operating. And I just think understanding codependence, naming that for people, is going to be huge. And again, for some people, that's what feels like love, or no one's ever named that as a problematic uh, thing. And again, I just think it's easy to think that my relapsing off my uh, uh, bipolar medicine or relapsing to substance use, but, but I would argue that, that untreated or relapses in codependence can be just as uh, threatening to someone's emotional well-being. Uh, naming the possibility in group, just say we've had a lot of people uh, who've been in this uh, community come have trouble, and ask your group members, to, as I did with you, to say what could happen if we're not careful, and have them talk about relapse and violence and uh, whatever other kind of stuff might occur. Um, I think uh, another suggestion for those of you who want to explore incorporating this into group is is to think about uh, group activity in which you say, what are our triggers uh, we ought to monitor for? Who, who gets triggered in your family or where you're going? What are those triggers like? And then what cues? Uh, I disclosed earlier that, that in terms of my clinical work, I have a stomach literally that reacts like something in my gut just says, mm, this isn't right. So asking people to think about their triggers or their cues, how to monitor those, you know, obviously, what we're teaching is, is emotional modulation, behavioral um, moderation. Um, and then uh, working potentially, in, depending on where you are, on a goal setting activity. As I approach Thanksgiving, I'm going to do X. It may involve the self-care planning that we just did as a group. It may involve how many meetings they're going to go to, how many visits with their sponsor. Um, uh, again, that the set of goals could be driven by a collaboration between you and your person. Uh, the next poll, I think I've got one more poll. This is the next to last. This may be the last one. Um, what goes wrong? What, what, I, what I said earlier in the model is any good plan, we have to say, well, we have to ask about barriers. And so, again, the key phrase here, most often. So the barriers, your clients most often. So this is somebody had kind of a plan, uh, went out. What's the most common reason clients don't succeed? Is it family sabotage? Is it unmanaged anxiety? Is it unrealistic hopes for others? Back to the theme of codependence. Is it lack of social support? I'm going to ask everybody who's willing, bring your cursor down there to the left. And let's just think about what common barriers, another 15 seconds. Great. All right. Looks like a bunch of you are concerned about anxiety. Uh, and I would argue that I'm, I would argue that many, many People with substance use disorder have underlying anxiety. That is part of that. So unmanaged anxiety uh, and unhealthy coping. Most of you, so it looks like we've got a majority, around lack of social support. So again, the themes that have emerged clearly from this, untended early injury, untended emotional stuff, leading to a need for additional support. Again, you guys are uh, confirming uh, the the reason behind this webinar, the idea here that uh, people are going to need new help with new coping skills and social support. And again, I'm really glad that we're doing this. I'm glad that you all made time. Zach, thank you for that. Um, I used the, the term ACEs earlier and, and, and sort of uh, the the hallmark, what, what the adverse childhood experiences are. Um, and here's how we know they're ACEs. So, whether you do the screening and just see these things happen in practice, these are a list of some of the behaviors that are associated with higher ACEs scores. Again, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, you um, uh, have uh, an ACEs score uh, and then more, more adverse childhood experiences, higher likelihood of some of these outcomes. So there's the behavioral outcome that totally makes sense based on what I know. Here's some of the physical 
and mental health outcome. Part of what's fascinating about this, again, is a behavioral health person, I, I don't, it's not my view of the world as much, but part of why a CDC is interested in this, has been interested, is the prevalence of ACEs among people with chronic diseases. Um, the, the gentleman that was the keynote of this conference that I keep talking about was one of the early uh, study authors of the ACEs study. And what he started with was uh, morbid obesity. So he, he was an internal medicine guy, I think. Um, I can't remember where he was, but he just was like dealing with uh, obesity and then uh, it seems like related to bariatric weight loss. Anyway, and he found people uh, gaining weight and regaining weight. And, uh, and, and so this dance about obesity led him to ask what's going on psychologically. And, and, and again, an internal medicine guy who just saw this symptom, uh, obesity, and, and then led uh, some of the early work. So again, from CDC's perspective, obviously things like depression, the behavioral health stuff, but also increase, increased prevalence of STIs, obesity, diabetes, heart cancer, COPD, injury uh, resulting in broken bones, um, all higher uh, the higher the ACEs score. And so again, the idea here is those affect our emotional and physical well-being, that both are impacted. Um, so in terms of moving a, with a client to plan, what do we do? We, we, we work with them collaboratively to name the goal. Um, uh, what I always say is right after that, you say what's going to make it hard for you. Um, I'm uh, adapting a tool that Dr. Rolnick put forward in the MI and healthcare tool. It's called the, um, I'll think of it. Uh, but it's a, it's a planning tool that, that it comes from the motivational interviewing in healthcare book. Basically, it says, what's your goal and what's the reason for the goal? What barriers might you face? And what specific things can you do to respond to those barriers? So it's really interesting, uh, the idea not just what are the barriers, but what can you do about it. The next question is, who can help you do this? And again, follow-up question, what are the specific tools you can use uh, to specific things they can do to help you. How will you know you're succeeding? And then a smart timeline, specific, measurable, whatever else. Again, I don't spend a lot of time. You guys know how to, uh, you're obviously really smart people. You know how to do good plan. Again, I just think about as we're doing this work and think about moving from assessment to intervention to developing a plan, just making sure sort of what's going to make it hard for you. From my perspective, and again, based on what you've told me in the polls, focusing on that green block, what barriers and what can you do about it, and that blue box in the top right, what, who can help you and what are the specific ways they can help you. Feel like there are two important uh, components in this model of planning that, um, uh, that, that you guys have told me that I just highlight based on the results of the um, of the chat functions. So um, I want to talk just a bit about safety. Obviously, we could do, could do, probably should do 90 minutes just about about uh, violence and the, or the risk of violence. In, in my clinical experience, this is a pretty unlikely uh, outcome. But I've done training uh, earlier this year on with uh, a group of people uh, in a domestic violence setting, an uh, agency that I've collaborated with for many years. And so I just think we can't um, do this work without at least saying for some folk, this may be going back to family of origin. It may be the case that because there are shared children with an ex or current spouse, uh, if someone's currently in a, a violent relationship, a lot of reasons why violence prevention may need may need to be part of what you're doing. So I just looked at the basic literature on how to create a safety plan. There's your definition there, that first bullet, personalized practical plan. The idea here is I'm going to work with this client who's who said there may be violence in my family, my ex-husband may come by, my old boyfriend usually heats up, whatever it is. If you get a flag that there's a potential for violence, it's a, a good cue to you to invite a discussion about uh, about safety. So uh, how to cope with emotions, uh, 
uh, how to let your friends know how to get social support, and then usually involves, especially in the case of threat of violence or domestic violence, um, what legal recourse there is to prevent it. We're talking about restraining orders, et cetera. So a good safety plan will have everything that, that somebody needs. And um, in doing this work, you kind of think through various scenarios, like, okay, what if he comes alone, and what if he surprises you, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so again, um, some really good literature. I've also included a patient uh, tool. Oh, here we go. Um, last chat. Uh, uh, some of you have, have done this work before with uh, people who are in violent or abusive relationships. Uh, what else have you counseled? I talked in general terms about the safety plan. Uh, but if any of you who have this experience could expand on this discussion, what if you counseled people to do? I'll go ahead and start and say social support. Uh, I think social support is the most important thing. Letting uh, you're, you're letting people know uh, that you have the potential for violence, that you, that you may need additional support. Again, if anybody else has experience in terms of creating safety plans, if you've got any suggestions for your peers about confide in a friend, safe word if you're in danger. Beautiful. Yeah, safe word. So in other words, uh, I may not uh, have a plan on where to go. I think increasingly using your phone, safe word or, or cues, like in other words, if I'm in the situation, I may not be able to pick up my phone and say, hey, Bruce is here, and I think we're heading towards, you know, whatever, uh, but texting a butterfly or texting thunderstorm or whatever as a way to get some uh, help. Uh, notify somebody and doing it, yeah, in a way that's coded. Have a plan where to go, social support. Any other thoughts? There's role playing. Beautiful. Anytime we're trying to build skill, somebody adds role playing. I think, yeah, if if we know someone's heading into a situation uh, where they need to de-escalate, um, anytime we're doing the role play, we say, I'm going to be you. And you're going to be him. You're going to be him because you know him better than I do. And so actually playing out, or let's say things start to get heated, what's something he would say? And then we model for our consumer what they might say. The reason for us to always take the client role is we model for them kind of an adaptive thing. Social support, access to hotlines, how to de-escalate, beautiful, plan to go, role play. And... Permission to call the police, exactly. Uh, I, I think for people that are so in it, depending on where they're at and they recover from it, just say it's not okay. It's okay for you to call the police. And I would argue, uh, add to that, it's okay to get legal intervention in advance so that, that if you do decide a restraining order, doing something uh, is appropriate, that you go ahead and do that. Thanks, guys. Those are great suggestions. Um, so somebody said hotline or something. There's a, uh, a, a website where you can get some help uh, from the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Uh, more information for you. This is about that they obviously offer a hotline, but there's also more information about safety planning there. This was the resource that I used to, to, to sort of bring the information I brought about safety planning. If you work with many people uh, for whom violence is possible or who've experienced violence, this is an excellent resource for you and the number at the hotline. Um, if any of my uh, Myra, Tanisha, friend, if anybody has access, I'm realizing the slide doesn't have the 800 number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. That's an omission. I'm going to ask one of my uh, colleagues uh, to put that forward. Mm, Denise says, specifically for LGBTQ intimate partner violence resources. Denise, most... Um, uh, interpersonal uh, violence places I know are very comfortable uh, doing, uh, incorporating same gender, gender non-conforming uh, folks. Obviously, it would be ideal. I don't know of many, and I'll put that out. What we'll do is, again, I'll ask my advocates or uh, I'll tear them people. If we've got any, if we can get that 800 number, I'm not aware, Denise, of, of, uh, of a place specific to LGBTQ violence. And so I'm going to ask my colleagues, just because I can barely run my slides, if they 
are willing to do a web search. I've got some really smart people working with me. So we'll see if we can find that before we stop. I see and people are typing. Oh, I love it. Naila says, fabulous. There's the um, uh, uh, 800 number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Uh, Denise Turner says, uh, GMHC, Gay Men's Health Crisis, is a wonderful resource uh, for people uh, around same gender violence. Uh, Naila's got the 800 number there. Thank you. And we'll keep working. I'm going to do a couple more slides, and we'll watch for any other LGBT, LG, LGBTQ. You'd think I'd know how to say that since I am one, but I can't. So uh, uh, LGBTQ into a partner, any specific. Anybody else GMH, beyond GMHC? Anybody else know any other? There you go. Oh, look at that. Great. So the hotline does, thank you, friends. So the, the national hotline does have a specific section on LGBT abuse. So they're, they're certainly, uh, again, I've, I've only worked with a few domestic violence places, but, but they're, they're, my experience is, and again, it's 2017, same gender uh, spouses or partners, gender nonconforming spouses, they pretty much are on board. Um, but again, I think you're right. And knowing our community, knowing our community resources, I think, one of the ways we re-injure LGBTQ folks is we don't do our work to say who are the resources in our community that we know are going to be uh, affirming and not re-injure our gay, lesbian, bi, trans, queer, intersex uh, clients. So thank you for that reminder. At least we know, thanks to Fran, that there is a, a specific site within the hotline uh, all right, great. So the last thing is about providing additional support. We're going to keep typing some recommendation. Looks like um, just a couple minutes. I want to make sure we have uh, additional time for uh, questions down there. Last thing is about providing additional support. Obviously, um, so uh, some thoughts here, some possible ways. Quinn Gentry, Quinn Gentry, Quinn Gentry. Awesome, all caps. Intimate partner violence seminars. Maybe Dr. Gentry will do a webinar, something for SAMHSA. Grantees, I know Dr. Gentry. She's a very wise soul, so that's good to know. Thank you, uh, Denise. Um, so some ways to assess how much support somebody's going to need. Who will be around that loves you? Who can you count on? What triggers? Uh, Who will be around that isn't using? I think that's really important. It's like, well, my aunt is nice, my brother's nice, my somebody's nice, but I really think for our substance using folks, uh, who isn't going to be using? Is, does anybody not use? I just think it's really problematic to be a person in recovery in a thing where everybody else is using. And, and again, we've got the combination of whatever stress is going on, whatever family history may be playing out or other, other trauma may be playing out. Um, and the idea that everybody around me is using, I just would argue that some of our most vulnerable folks, everybody is using. You know, that the bottom line is, is so much of what we see is multi-generational substance use, multi-generational mental health stuff, so that, in fact, um, uh, just finding somebody who's not using uh, could be available. Um, how can you exit when you want? Who can help you get out? Uh, who knows your HIV status? This is ex exclusive to uh, HIV-positive individuals. And then what are the pros and cons of disclosure? I've worked with people with HIV since 1984. And what I can tell you is I never, ever want to take responsibility for someone's choice to disclose. I realize that people should disclose to their sex partners and, you know, and, and their health care providers. But in terms of people taking a risk by disclosing to family or friends, I don't want that to be my decision. And so the way around that is to say let's you and me talk through your perception of the pros and cons of disclosure of your HIV status. The reality is people are disowned by their family, people are fired from jobs. As I said at the start of the webinar, stigma of HIV isn't done. And so uh, do you want to tell who knows what are the good or bad things about disclosing and letting people make their own choice, I think, is a caution there. Um, because there's no HIPAA, there's no HIPAA at the uh, family Thanksgiving. And so if I say I get HIV, I got to be there, and many of the family I'm most concerned about are not 
uh, very able to meet the needs. So uh, options for support, more support from clinicians, from us as, as therapists or clinicians, some ideas about using your recovery community that is uh, you, you, whatever your network is, sponsor or friends in the program or go to me, call your sponsor, figuring that out. And then assessing the need for emergency support. Talked about um, uh, violence a minute ago, but but is there any history of suicidal? I'm sorry, I used a definition or abbreviations here. Suicidal ideation, SI, homicidal ideation, HI, any problems, uh, uh, concerns about someone maintaining their mental status. And then proactively talking about emergency phone numbers, on-call therapists, 800 numbers for people with mental health stuff, those of you who have ACT teams, how do I get a hold of the ACT team if it's a, a mental health disorder? And, and where, I, where I work, primarily in the southeast, most places have ACT teams that come out when someone's in an emotional crisis really up against the wall and provide some ongoing uh, immediate crisis kind of support there in the field. So, so again, we, what's incumbent on us is to think through where they've been, what kind of stress they're going to be under, develop a plan and make sure that that plan includes figuring out how much support, offering whatever support. I think what's important is don't offer yourself unless you're willing to do it. Do not give up your Thanksgiving unless you're being compensated, for instance. Uh, steps in a good referral, I'm not going to go over this for you again, just kind of figure out what what's already exists in their uh, history, what it would already exist in their network. Refer to people you know, offer it as an option. Figure out how much support people will need. You know, some folk just need a piece of paper and a bus token. Other folk need the sheriff to drive them there. And so we're kind of figuring out active, I call it active versus passive referral is an advanced skill. The last bullet there just says what about uh, doing any continuous quality improvement, do we get back to our referral source and say, did they show up? Do we hear from consumers, hey, did you go? How was the service you got there? I just think there's a role for thinking about uh, QI in that process. Uh, let's not forget about us, by the way. Uh, we talked earlier when we started about this being stressful for consumers and us. Uh, let's acknowledge that they're stressful for us. Uh, you know, here's my own bias, the social atmosphere. I'm, the, I'm that guy that goes into target the first time the trees are up and Santa uh, is up and I just draw a deep breath. I, I say something I can't say on a federally funded webinar. Oh, blank. Just fill in your own blank. Oh, blank is at that time already. So force fun, overspending, obligation, just all the stuff that, that some of us may feel. Many of us have addiction, co-addiction, adverse childhood experience in our future. So we're talking about kind of leading people through a plan for their own stuff. For some of us, it is our own stuff as well. Stigma about HIV and behavioral health can affect us. You know, that the bottom line is uh, we can, uh, in fact, uh, experience the same stigma. Last reminder is that empathy is a two-edged sword and uh, practicing what we preach, uh, you know, that... Uh, my self-care plan. Let me, real quick, what do you plan to do to, to help yourself? I'm going to have you And with that while we're doing that. If you'll go ahead and type what's helped you in the past, have you coped with your own stressors, if you're willing, last two questions for us so that you can do that. While, I'm do, while you're giving us some suggestions about your own self-care plan, I've got a question in the box. Do I think that the clinician in recovery should use these holiday discussions to self-disclose to, to patients. Um, I, I feel um, really mixed about this. I think the clinical decision to disclose our own uh, codependence, our own history, is, is really based on a number of things. I think it's about our relationship with that consumer. One, somebody I, I really respect once said self-disclosure is a gift, and do we give it to everybody? Do we give it too early in a relationship? Uh, does the client have their own ability to make their own decisions? In other words, for me to offer self-disclosure, here's what I do. If I'm not careful and I'm oversharing, I'm sharing with too many people, it's never about our needs. So I think mindfully, um, I think certainly there's a role as clinicians to say, yes, I'm in recovery as well, or I'm a codependent as well. Um, I also think there's room to talk in general terms about our own struggle without disclosing that. I think there are times when 
a disclosure of our own substance use codependence can be huge and helpful times when we cross a boundary and it becomes about us. And uh, that's the dance, I'd say. So we've got some great things. Spending time with your children. Oh, somebody must have good children. Somebody uh, says so, uh, stay home. Yeah, somebody shuts down. Uh, do not do not cook. No expectations from me. Go to friends and let them take care of it. Good for you. Take a couple days off. Get a massage. Ooh, doesn't sound good. Weighing the importance of the time. Not over committing. Uh, I guess somebody's a dancer. Somebody's going to Zumba and dancing, talking to friends. Meditation. Anything else. Beautiful. Weighing the importance of the holiday. Get a massage. Meditation. Bubble bath. Yoga. I can't remember what holiday. I went to yoga. I must have Thanksgiving a couple years ago. I started the day with yoga. Man, that was a great. I should remember to do that. Somebody just reminded me of what I should do. Thank you for that. Bubble bath, dance. Talk to our own therapist. Talk to our own support networks. It's not there. I will add that for myself, talking to people that can support me. Marathon, there it is. Marathon meetings, fellowship with other recovering addicts. Talking to people that understand. And I would say talking to other clinicians doing this work. Um, somebody said letting people know I'm not caught up on the holidays and it is fine to not participate um, one, of, one of the things that, that isn't here that I just suggest leaning on your colleagues whether it's formal clinical supervision or whatever else part of what can come from this webinar is is you guys saying hey I was on a webinar SAMHSA webinar got some good ideas and and this good-looking bald dude said we need to support each other and so um, I think that uh, using this to move forward and kind of say, hey, this is a tough time for us as clinicians here. The part of why I was delighted they were doing this is, is we've got a tough six, seven, eight weeks coming up, and for you guys to do work with your clients and yourself and your colleagues, anybody on this thing um, that is a supervisor or a clinical supervisor, I'm challenging you to step up and kind of say, hey, I'm going to proactively support my staff, give them some tools, to do this work. Man, you guys got great, some great suggestions there. All right, I'm going to move. I think I'm done. Am I done? I feel like I'm done. Questions. Let me see what else. Denise, who I paid $5, said it's the best webinar ever. It pays to pay people. Any suggestions for prevention workers to support their consumers, particularly those in group settings? Okay, so specific about prevention. Uh, again, I think I'd argue adopting the model I put forward. What's stressful about this time? Um, you know, again, on the prevention side, it may not be that we have active use yet, but I still think to say this is stressful time. It's more stressful based on, on uh, for people that have had um, uh, difficult uh, childhood experiences. Let's talk about, you know, how people can pay attention to themselves, what healthy coping looks like. Uh, again, that model, I would just have you go back. Obviously, if it's a primary prevention, we're not talking about how I avoid relapse. Uh, how I avoid misusing, but I think the concepts of stress, challenging emotion, adaptive versus maladaptive ways of coping with the stress, that's the heart of the thing, adaptive versus, and I want to help you guys make more adaptive uh, choices. Uh, Fran says, Jim, it's great. Again, Fran, I owe you $5. Uh, Eugenia, I'm, I'm, I'm helpful. Um, uh, Glad this has been helpful. Like I said, my own experience when the, the folks at SAMHSA asked me about this is it's just such a hard time of year for us. And again, because I care about my people, they don't show up, they relapse, you're left wondering, they reappear mid-January or whenever, strung out and something. Um, anyway, I, I just, I felt, I, I'm glad that, that they saw a need to support you. Please feel free to... Um, Feel, feel free to share these materials with people. Um, yeah, um, yeah. so I'm going to shut up because now they do a, uh, uh, who's going to come up, Naila or um, Tanisha going to talk about next steps and what other support for you. So I'm going to bow out. Apparently my fee now goes to $10 uh, per person who people say, nice, next webinar. Anyway, thank you guys for making time to do this. I know everybody's busy. It's Friday. There's a lot going on. I hope there's been something helpful for you, something that you can use. Uh, again, my, my main takeaway is, is the, the tsunami is coming, the, the avalanche is coming. Uh, get ready for it. So. Uh, with that, I think Tanisha is going to come back and talk about other options for you. So thanks to each of you for making time. 
thanks to the great people at AHP that, that did the work behind the scenes. And now we're going to talk about uh, additional resources. Thank you so much, Jim. This was excellent. I learned a lot as usual um, with you. And, um, and thank you all so much for your participation. This was really great, and we can't do these things without you. Um, if you would like further technical assistance, we offer it through things like our webinars, our, our virtual events like today, and also you can get on-site TA. Um, some typical TA needs are sustainability, you know, moving forward and planning for the future. Social media is a popular one. Recruitment, engagement, and retention is always something that we talk about. And there's so much more, so please feel free to request TA. It's absolutely free to every grantee. Um, you can contact your, um, your GPO to request TA, and you can go directly onto SPARS now, too, and request it that way. So thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it over to Zach. Thank you, Tanisha, and thank you, Jim. And I also just want to thank everybody who joined us today as a participant. Uh, we do have a couple materials that you can download in the far left under the slide. There's a download pod. You can click on those. You just click on it, and then you click Download Files. You can also access the CEH feedback and quiz for today by clicking on the box next to the downloads. You just click on that where it says CEH feedback and quiz, then click Browse to. That link will also be sent with the recording of today's event in a follow-up email to everybody. So thanks again, and have a great day.